We're so glad you're joining us uh, and and good morning to you. Happy Mother's Day. We'll be doing a, a little bit of talking and praying about that this morning and just thankful uh, to be with you in this format. Our church offices are open through the week. Pastor Matt and I are working and keeping in contact and uh, ministering to any needs we find out about. So please, if it's within our membership or if it's a neighbor or an extended member of your family, if there's something we could do to help in a benevolent way or just a care way, we have folks in the church and we have resources in the church and we'd like like to help. But what I was going to say just a minute, minute ago, uh, two of our men showed up to, to count. Thank you for the offerings. They continue to come in faithfully. I'm very thankful for that. But it's just good to see faces. So I know you're missing that as well. And uh, in, in a small extent, we see that here at the office week by week. And we're very thankful. We miss you. We look forward to assembling together soon. Join us Wednesday, 630 on the GoToMeeting platform for a congregational prayer. That's a time of open prayer. Nobody is required or obligated to pray, but everyone has the opportunity to pray. So please don't be intimidated. Join that. The, inf the access code and information for that uh, is on our church website. Again, that's the go-to meeting, congregational prayer time, 6.30 to 6.50 p.m. on Wednesday. And then right after that, we'll be back in the study, 7 p.m. Wednesday evening, continuing our study in First Peter. Next Sunday, we're beginning something new. Um, we are doing in the study, gospel edition. We'll be doing that at 6 p.m. on Sunday for seven Sundays in a row. Um, it'll be Pastor John, it'll be me, and it will be Pastor Evan from Engage Community Church going through different elements of the gospel. This is meant to equip us in the gospel, to remind and to teach us and strengthen us in the gospel, but this is also meant to be an evangelism ministry uh, that, can, that will produce videos to be used in an ongoing way for evangelism. Um, again, Happy Mother's Day to the moms who are out there, to all the children out there. Honor your mom today in a special way. Um, our call to worship this morning is coming from Psalm 11, verses 4 through 7. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals upon the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. Because the Lord is righteous and he loves righteous deeds, and the upright shall behold his face. Let's pray together wherever you are. Pray with us. Lord, Heavenly Father in heaven, we praise you, we honor you, we confess that you are holy, 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 and righteous, and good, and mighty to save. Father, in an age where fear of the Lord is out of fashion, I pray you would impress it upon our hearts and minds to reverence you and stand in awe of you, even fall down in awe and wonder who you are. Father, we worship you this morning in spirit and truth. It's in Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Our hymn uh, this morning is, is Fairest Lord Jesus, number 88 in our church hymnal, if you have one of those uh, at home. And uh, we'll be singing uh, the first, I think it's the first, second, and last verse of that uh, hymn. Number, well, Fairest Lord Jesus. You'll remember it. I chose this because of just the beauty of the colors as if you're out and about at all or if you just look out your window you're seeing the beautiful colors of spring and the hymn writer used that as just a springboard for the glory of christ and he shines much brighter fairest lord jesus fairest lord jesus Cherish thee. 
will I honor, thou my soul's glory, Lord, and crown. Fair are the meadows, fairer still the woodlands, robed in the hurrying garb of spring. Jesus is fairer, Jesus is purer, who makes the woeful heart to sing. Beautiful Savior, Lord of all nations, the Son of God and Son of Man. Glory and honor, praise, adoration, now and forevermore be thine. I miss the voices of the congregation, but it's good to sing with you uh, this morning. To the moms who do so much, uh, thank you. Uh, may your children, as Proverbs 31 mentions, uh, states, may your children rise up and bless you. That's Proverbs 31 and verse 28. And this was my attempt uh, to do that as a 20-year-old in college. I guess that's a time in life perhaps where we uh, mature a little bit and think about um, where I was away from home. Uh, think about uh, all of the things that moms do. We begin to appreciate them more. Out of those thoughts uh, came this song, and I sing it to my mom, still living at 93, uh, almost like a spring chicken, not quite anymore, but uh, sing it to her and remember all of the ways that she has cared and still cares uh, for her children and now her grandchildren, even great-grandchildren. <laughs> There's a lady that I love with the grace of our Lord above. She has helped me down the narrow road of life. She made me smile when I was feeling sad. Gave me the best of all she had. Day after day, a life of sacrifice. And today's her special day, the 24 hours just can't be played. Years of dedication she has shown. She has given me so much, and so can only touch. All the love and care that I have known. Correcting me time and again And though I did not know it then She planted seeds that helped me grow to a better man She told me of Jesus before I could talk And in his path she helped me walk Abiding hand in God's eternal plan and today's a special day, 24 hours just can't repay. Years of dedication she has shown. She has given me so much, and so can only touch. All the love and care that I have known. Very nice. Let's pray. Father, I ask first of all that you would grant a special comfort to those whose mothers are not with them today <clears throat> in one way or another. Father, we thank you for our moms. 
we thank you for the gift and the blessing, the grace of motherhood. And we pray for our mothers, that you would comfort them, that you would bless them, that you would help us in our hearts and minds to honor them according to your word, according to your design for family, as the building block of society, and even as church, these homes that you've given us. Father, we pray your comfort and blessing. It's in Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you were uh, made available to you was the outline for today. If you have that, if not, we'll be, I'll be repeating it as we, we go along. I remember as a child, um, the World Book en Encyclopedia uh, was on our shelf. And one of my favorite uh, places to look in that was a series of clear overlays colored with color diagrams on them uh, of the human body. And it started with the skeleton and you would see that on the page. And some of you remember this because you had the same set or had a similar set. And you would bring the next page over and it would add, uh, I think it was major organs and blood vessels. And that was pretty cool. And then you'd, you'd, you'd do another overlay and it would be the brain and the nervous systems. And then the muscles and the tendons and then the skin. And it was just amazing to see all that was a part of the human body, the design of the body how it works together is is beyond anyone's any human's complete understanding it is uh, designed by god as the scripture uh, passage will tell us this morning it has lots of parts and they work together together keeping the body healthy healthy most of the time god made it and in the passage today God uses the human body and all its different parts and how it works together in unity, uses that an as an example of what the church body is like. Uh, different Christians brought together, doing different things, just like different parts of our body, different organs and so forth, doing different things that help the church as a whole be healthy. We wanna keep that in mind as we go through the text. Let me read one of the verses and then we'll go to prayer. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. We'll be looking at 12 through 31 this morning. Verse 12 says, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we, we do thank you for this great illustration that we carry with us every day. We wake up with it. And Lord, most of the time in most people's lives, it works well. And we thank you that you've designed the body. We thank you for life and breath to it. We pray, Father, uh, that you would help us to see the similar unity and usefulness of each member in the passage today. Lord, we, we pray for those whose bodies are hurting. Uh, we pray, Father, for, for Doris Miller. We thank you that Jim did well in his surgery and is, um, is, is getting stronger. Father, we, we pray thanking you that Lou Carter was able to make it home, help him to receive uh, rehabilitation therapy in in home. Father, we pray for uh, our brother Gil, who's having a angioplasty Tuesday. We pray that uh, whatever is needed uh, would be able to be done uh, safely and without incident. We pray, Father, for for uh, Terry Schmidt, who's has another case of shingles. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would uh, bless her uh, in your mercy. Um, help this to, to, to subside uh, quickly, we would ask. Father, we also think of um, Tom Stoll this morning, our uh, state uh, associate executive, executive director for, the, for our convention of churches. Uh, we know his father passed and he couldn't go down there. He couldn't be a part of anything uh, close to his death. I know he's hurting from that, but I thank you for the life of his dad. And I thank you that uh, uh, from his testimony, his dad is with you. 
Lord, we would pray for uh, the family of Ann Shriver. We pray for Connie, her daughter, that you'd help her to be strong. We thank you for the food that has come in that has continued to bless them. Father, we pray for our, our president and our governor and their teams that are helping them to know what is best, especially for Governor Hogan. We would ask that you give him wisdom in, in whatever announcements would come this week. And we pray for understanding of those announcements. We pray for safety. We pray for a diminishing of the effects of this virus. We thank you for those on, on the medical front lines. Keep them safe, we pray. Thank you for their work. We, we thank you for moms and dads who are doing more in the way of schoolwork. Bless them in that. For some, it's more easy than others, but uh, for those who have many kids and many different assignments, bless them, Father. Help them to persevere and, and to do uh, the best they can. Lord, we, we pray for business owners. We pray for folks who are hurting financially. We pray, Father, that if there are needs that uh, we can help with as a church, you would make those uh, known to us through our membership, through friends uh, of this fellowship. Lord, much more uh, to pray for. We thank you for this time. We thank you for hearing our prayers. We ask that you would unite our hearts in the scripture. Help us to understand it. May your spirit apply it to our hearts. May this be a time of sanctification for believers. Father, would you draw the lost, any lost who are um, looking at this uh, video uh, broadcast now or in future days. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Many of the Corinthians had the idea that, uh, that all Christians uh, should have the same gift it seems obvious they were fixated on the gift of of speaking in tongues and and that definite steps could or should be taken uh, that everyone would have that gift well paul is answering that uh, issue in the church in chapter 12 13 and 14 and he argued in the first part that we looked at last week first part of chapter 12 that the Holy Spirit has placed great diversity of gifts in the church for the church's good. We read last week, now there are variety, varieties of gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, 4, varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. And Paul says in verse 11 that the Holy Spirit um, distributes gifts as he wills. So it is futile for anyone in the Corinthian church in Paul's day, or for anyone in our church, it is futile to try to dictate to the Holy Spirit regarding the giving of, of spiritual gifts. Paul wants the Corinthians and God wants us to be assured that diversity of spiritual gifts in the church is a good thing. It does not threaten unity. Uh, in fact, it enhances and promotes unity and health in the church. And his illustration of this, as we'll see in the passage, and as I've already mentioned, is the human body. The human body that God has given us um, it, it is a supreme object lesson in scripture of diversity working in unity. It, it's mentioned in several uh, key passages, particularly with relationship to uh, the church, but also for other things. So ask the general question with me, what is it that unites Christians? Does our unity come from all being just alike well in in some ways i mean we need to think alike we need to think biblically doctrinally there there are certainly ways we need to be just exactly alike in our understanding of god and jesus and the holy spirit and the gospel and so forth and, and that's always our quest as a church to be like there but our unity does not come from being alike in our giftedness and our abilities um it's rooted in, in, in something else. Uh, and this morning, five principles uh, we'll see in the giving of and use of 
spiritual gifts. Number one, our unity is rooted in the Holy Spirit. Uh, he is overseeing the distribution distribution of gifts. Look at verse 12. But before that, he is the one who brings us uh, into the body. For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. And I think uh, Paul brings Christ in here in after he gives this um, object lesson of the human body to, to, tr to, to tell you he's going to use the body to talk about Christ as the head of a body. He doesn't use that expression here, but certainly he does mm -hmm. in, in the teaching of the church. So Christ as the head of the body has a body composed of the members who have various gifts and functions like the different members of the human body. That's what verse 12 is pointing us toward. And they are vitally connected with the head. We might think of the brain in the human body, which, you know, is controlling all the functions of the body. Christ being the head. And, and here's how we're, we're connected, or here's how we are vitally connected to Christ. Look at verse 13. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. So let's take that verse apart and think about how we uh, have been brought into the church. Well, by one spirit, by the Holy Spirit, we were all, every believer. And notice Paul uh, gives examples, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. So right, or, right away we realize unity doesn't depend on being the same because all different ethnic backgrounds, different social backgrounds, different economic levels are brought into the body of Christ. And it says they are baptized into one body. Now, baptized into one body is a reference to a definite past event. The aorist uh, tense is being used here, which in the Greek means something definite that happened in the past. In the past, the word baptized means immerse. We were immersed in, made a part of the body of Christ, the church, by the saving work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Paul speaks of this in Titus 3, 5. Um, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, and listen to the next part, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So Paul is referencing the Spirit's part in our salvation when he says baptized into one body. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not an experience to seek, but a reality to acknowledge. Now I'm going to say that again because this has been misunderstood in uh, churches uh, throughout history. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not an experience to seek, like a second blessing. It is a reality to acknowledge. Uh, some believe, I will acknowledge that, some believe that this baptism of the Spirit is an experience that takes place after conversion. That's not what Paul is saying here or anywhere in the scripture. They say, those types of thinkers say that there are two groups of Christians, basically, those who have been saved but not baptized by the Spirit, and those who are not only saved but also baptized. I remember as a college student, someone from one of those groups wanted to pray for me for the second blessing. I don't know if he uh, thought I didn't have it by looking at, at me and my testimony, but I, I remember I, I allowed him to pray. Uh, I was at a time in my life where I was growing in my understanding of Scripture. I didn't think that I was missing anything, um, but I said, pray for me. And he did, and guess what? Uh, nothing happened because I don't believe I was missing anything. Nothing emotional happened. I was not giving any any new gift at that time. So some say there are two groups. And, and that Christians in that first group that haven't been baptized by the Spirit yet live weaker spiritual lives, while those in the second group abound in power and blessing. Well, I don't want to use an anecdotal 
experience of my own to, to speak against this. I'm going to use the verse here. We, we need only to look at the word all to realize there are not two groups of Christians. There is one, all, uh, whether Jews, Greeks, uh, slaves are free or baptized into one body. Paul's point, there was no need for the Corinthians to worry about the diversity of gifts hurting their unity because their unity lay elsewhere in their common experience of one, being placed in the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit, and two, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, which takes place at the point of conversion. Pastor Matt? I really appreciate this phrase you used earlier, um, speaking about the different members of Christ's body, when you said they're vitally connected with the head, Christ, and each other. And this point about unity of believers is rooted in the individual believers' unity with Christ. Each believer as an individual has been united to Christ, has been filled with the Spirit of Christ, and therefore we're united to one another. We're bound together by His Holy Spirit that fills us. And the church, the local church, is the body of Christ. And this so the central way to serve Christ is to serve His church. Not the only way, but the central way. Okay. The, way, the central way to give to Christ is to give to his church. If you love Christ, you'll love the church. If you despise Christ, you'll despise the church. But as long as we th think of church as a, a building or an e just an event, or if we think of church maybe as just a religious organization, we won't get this point. But if we see church for what it really is, people. People who've been united to Christ by faith people who've been filled with the Holy Spirit of Christ, then we'll start to understand the nature of the unity that we're talking about, that Paul's talking about. We're united to each other, bound to each other, because we're united to Christ. We're united to God through Christ by the Spirit, right? And so you are God's child, and I'm God's child, and this one's God's child. Therefore, we're siblings one to another. Amen. Notice... As we go further in verse 13, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Uh, a, a statement here of the spirits indwelling of every Christian. Uh, when you drink water, water goes inside of your body. Uh, that's, that's the image here, made to drink, the spirit coming in. In Romans 8 verse 9, uh, Paul writes, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Mm -hmm. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So notice that we are made to drink. All drink, but all are made to drink. The language is a reminder that in salvation, the, the Holy Spirit doesn't ask you to receive him or tell you to pray to receive him. He comes in because it is God's will for him to come in. That's the design of being born again. And so every Christian is baptized into the body by the Holy Spirit at the point of conversion. Every Christian is at the point of conversion indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Our unity is rooted in the Spirit, number one. Number two, our unity is rooted in the worth of every member. Paul's going to go back and forth uh, to these two main themes, that it's a sovereign work of God and you are valuable to the body of Christ. And we'll see that in the outline. But verse 14, our unity is rooted in the worth of every member. For the body is not one member, but many. And so here's God's object lesson of the human body related to the church body. Uh, verse 15, if the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. I'm glad for both my hands and my feet, and you are too. Uh, if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. Now, there are those in uh, church, in, in local churches, who, because they are not like certain others, 
they don't have the same giftedness. They feel they don't belong. Paul wants you to know. God wants you to know. I, your pastor, your pastors Amen. today want you to know that you are vital uh, to the body of Christ at North Hartford Baptist Church, or if you're watching and you're a member of another local church, you're vital there. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? So, so suppose, go along with Paul's illustration, suppose each member could uh, of the body of Christ could choose the gift, the ministry ability that he or she most wanted. What would the church be like? It's hard to say, but we might have too many teachers or not enough teachers because one of the greatest fears is speaking in front of people. So maybe we wouldn't have enough or too many leaders and not enough servants to carry out leadership or the other way around. Aspects of ministry would certainly suffer and thus the church would suffer. Paul's point is, is that each member and each gift has worth in God's eyes. Each is necessary to the proper working of the church. Pastor Matt? This idea, this picture of unity and diversity is just all throughout this section. Of course, the supreme example of that is God himself, Father, Son, Son Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit, diversity in persons, but one God in essence. Uh, but how can you discern your spiritual gift. I have five of these quickly. Uh, you won't have time to write them down, but you can watch the playback. First of all, pray for wisdom and seek wisdom in God's word. Or right, let's not uh, imagine this is the one aspect of Christian life that you um, <laughs> should try to figure out apart from God's word, but pray for wisdom. Start there, pray for wisdom and seek wisdom in God's word. Uh, number two, join a biblical church. These are gifts that you're talking about by their very nature yes. are gifts um, that are living and active and present themselves in church members who are active parts of a body. So join a biblical church. Number three, pray for and cultivate a servant's heart, which is, I think, the key aspect that the Corinthians were missing. Yes. They were using their gifts in a proud way, in an unloving way, which is the opposite way you're supposed to use a gift. Pray for and cultivate a servant's heart. God help us, Pastor John. We know that does not come naturally. A servant's heart does not come naturally. Number four, ask these two questions. And by the way, these are not necessarily steps to take. These are, you know, these should you should always be doing all of these. Um, ask these questions. Where is there a need? And can I help to meet it? Where is there a need? And can I help to meet it? Uh, one of the key ways you'll be able to discern your spiritual gift is looking out for people to serve and help and care for and not looking inward, thinking, um, what do I like? What would make me feel good? No. Uh, number five, finally, seek the wisdom of the church and of the church leadership. Seek the wisdom of the church and of the church leadership. In other words, pastor, don't do this in a vacuum. Right. Right. Don't yeah. go at it alone. Spiritual gifts are not discerned and used in a vacuum, but in the context of a community, a community of faith. Yeah, let me just add one thing quickly. I, I never saw myself as a teacher, um, you know, until I began to lead that dorm Bible study. And it wasn't that I saw myself as a pastor then. I just enjoyed the study of the Word of God. So where did that begin? That began with let's have a dorm Bible study, and I was open. I saw a need for it, for that week-to-week -week encouragement on a college campus, a secular college campus, and got involved in it, uh, took the leadership position. That was probably the hard step to actually say yes to something like that, but it was such a blessing. And, you know, you may do that, and you may find, well, this, this isn't where I'm gifted but you've still helped the church by seeking to meet a need but i like what you said look out uh, see those needs and i think god uses that to create burdens in our heart that he wants us to keep following and, and by the way it doesn't mean you'll be perfect at what you do right away but you, you know that you'll see usefulness in it the church will be blessed by it he'll continue to to move you in those directions well our unity I want to skip one. I almost did. Our unity is 
rooted in the Holy Spirit. Our unity is rooted in the worth of every member. And then we go back to the sovereignty of God here. Our unity is rooted in the sovereign grace of God in verse 18. But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. Now, he, he's talking about the physical body. He's made the body just as he's desired, but we are to take that and realize that's what he's doing in the church as well. So appreciate a believer, pr appreciate this morning God's sovereign grace to you uh, and to others that are in the body of Christ and appreciate God's sovereign placement of each believer into the body, the local church, uh, yourself being placed there at North Hartford Baptist Church or somewhere else, and the others that are there. Appreciate them. We all have something wonderful in common. God say, if you're saved, God saved you and placed you in his church because notice he desired to. That's great in verse 18. So God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. Pastor Matt? I love this image here. It's so clear. Verse 18, uh, God has placed the members, each one of them, right? So all yeah. of them, yeah. in the body, just as he desired. He's putting things where they need to go. And where they need to go is based on his wisdom. There's another illustration of the church that overlaps nicely with this picture of God putting things where they need to go according to his wisdom. And it's... Uh, Pick this illustration that pictures believers as stones that right. God builds a building out of. First Corinthians three nine, Paul, the Apostle Paul calls the church God's building. Matthew sixteen eighteen, Jesus says, "I will build my church." First Peter two four and five, as you come to Him, a living stone rejected by men. Uh, this is talking about Jesus. As you believer, come to him, Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, church, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 2, 20 through 22, uh, picking up on the end of verse 19, where Paul uses the phrase, the household of God, and then he uses this illustration in verse 20, built, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure, the whole structure being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God the Spirit. And, you know, you have the illustration itself, but the overarching picture and the principle there is God is sovereign. God is doing the work. God is putting things and building things where they need to be, how they need to be. We are the building materials. We're recipients of this grace, but God is the one doing the work. And of course, in any spiritual issue, that should be our mindset. God is the one doing it. We are recipients of his grace. Well, thank you for some very well-placed uh, cross-references. I appreciate that. Our unity is rooted in the Holy Spirit. We've seen that. Our unity is rooted in the worth of every member. Our unity is rooted in the sovereign grace of God. Number four, our unity is rooted in the necess I'm sorry, necessity of of each member. So the worth of every member, we saw that, but the necessity of every member, this is our mindset toward one another. Verse 19, if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Uh, so notice that Paul is, is, is speaking, it seems to me, of those obvious organs that we, you know, we know we rely on, like, like our, our eyes, and inferior ones like our feet, even though, you know, we, if we didn't have them, we would know that they are important. But the superior organs, I think he is making the point, they need the inferior ones. On the contrary, verse 22 
It is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. What's he talking about there? I don't know. I'm going to suggest maybe the uh, the, the organs are, are, yes, the organs, the things, the members of the body that we don't see, that we know are extremely valuable. But think of the inside organs. Go back to that world book example and, and you pull, pull over this one flap and it shows you the heart, the lungs, the liver. Uh, the kidney. They're not seen, but yet they are vital to the body. Life can't exist without them. So those which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those, verse 23, those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become more presentable. Thinking again of the human body, well, the internal organs are not pleasant to look at, but they are necessary uh, to the function of of the body, and and that makes them respected and appreciated, especially if you have heart trouble or lung trouble. You know those things that you never see and hardly ever think about are, are, are vital to you. This is Paul's answer to the pride of the most visibly gifted. He is saying to the church, okay, you, you you may have a gift that everybody notices, but you're not more important than others that people don't notice. Verse 24, whereas our more presentable members have no need of the honor. He's talking, going back to verse 23. They naturally receive honor, but God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to the member, to that member which lacked. So God has designed visible public gifts to have a crucial place, but equally designed and more vital to life, he is saying, are the hidden gifts, such as, I'm just going to suggest, serving or mercy or administration or exhortation, which often takes place alongside someone. Uh, It can take place publicly, but often and most most helpful it's alongside someone else and no one ever may ever see that conversation except the two of you or three of you but it is vital to the life of the church verse 25 so that there may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another see see here is the evidence that we understand unity in the body of Christ and the worth of every member and the necessity of of every member is that there's no division and there is in your heart toward everyone else care, appreciation of every member in the body. Pastor Matt, did you have something here? I have a few things. Yeah, first of all, something on this phrase, same care for one another, or even just this, care for one another from verse 25, care for one another. Uh, Citizens in the kingdom of God are allies, not competitors. We need to see ourselves as allies, not in competition, uh, not in an unspoken competition for attention or prominence. We're not called to prominence. Right. We're called to service. And then also uh, at the beginning of verse 25, no division in the body. Boy, is that something to pray for? No division right. in the body. What am I saying about the cross of Christ if I cause or endorse or even ignore division and fighting in the church. What I'm saying really is, although we wouldn't say this out out loud, that the blood of Christ is sufficient to reconcile me to God, but not sufficient to reconcile me to you. And that's a problem there because the effects of the cross spiritually are first and foremost to reconcile sinners to God and also reconcile sinners to each other in christ and so it would be a contradiction it would be hypocrisy it would be a mock a mockery of the death of christ to cause division or to endorse division or fighting or to ignore division and fighting in the church Um, there's got to be a paradigm shift in how we think about church today the popular mindset is fashion things and fit things based on my desires and my preferences and in a, in a culture that's screaming out to us 
be about you and then shapes our thinking about church underneath on, in that category uh we we need to be a voice in this wilderness that that says you no know, repent don't make things all about you make things all about god and his glory and in christ then therefore make things about others caring for others so this idea of unity in christ and caring for each other ha has to be in the front of our minds if we're to be the people God's called us to be. And so in the Corinthian church, this spiritual gifts were being used by some uh, to create, uh, well, the opposite of unity. It was, you know, tongues was being uh, elevated to be spiritual, that those are the spiritual ones. And, and so those who did not speak in tongues were, uh, were not looked at in the same way. And Paul is just wiping that out and saying, you're wrong, absolutely wrong. That's not the way to think. That's not biblical thinking. And so uh, that biblical thinking, I appreciate Pastor Matt's application, goes to many other areas of when we struggle with one another. And we're going to have struggles with one another, but we must put unity at, at the forefront and understand the scriptural reasons for it and understand uh, the motivation behind it, which of course is the cross of Christ and, and God's uh, God's forgiveness of us. We can forgive others. All right. May I interject one more thing on this? You, you can. It's How would I say no publicly? It's all, I, it's all it's live. <laughs> you can't say no. That would not embody the unity we're talking about. It, it was diabolical. What they were doing is creating a, a class like system, a, like a spiritual class system in the church it is shocking that at one point you find out there imagine this celebrating the lord's supper yeah in, in at different times right, separate right. could you imagine if if at church we had a group of people a clique in the church that came early and celebrated the lord's supper by themselves Th that i mean that category doesn't exist for us the uh, the depth of their division um but there's hope for them, just like there's hope for us in our weaknesses and the ways we need to be sanctified. But that's really what they were doing in the church is creating a class system. So every member, important, necessary. Look at verse 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Uh, no one should ever feel isolated in the body of Christ. Uh, just an illustration. Most people have accidentally hit their thumb with a hammer trying to nail something. If you haven't, let me tell you what it's like. Well, the other, other parts of your body uh, try to help out right away. Your arm pulls that thumb out of the way just so it won't happen again. Your wrist shakes it out trying to relieve the pain. In fact, you you stand up jump, yeah. and you jump around. Your legs go into motion because somehow that helps. I'm not sure. And your vocal cords <laughs> yell out something. Ow! And and, and after that, even uh, your mouth gets involved. I'm not going to do it here. But you normally, a lot of people will put their thumb in their mouth and just for that soothing of uh, the mouth. And, and so just think of how the body gets involved. It's il illustrative of, of how the church is to come together. Our unity is rooted in the Holy Spirit. Our unity is rooted in the worth of every member. Our unity is rooted in the sovereign grace of God. Our unity is rooted in the necessity of each member. Our unity is rooted in the sovereign appointments of God. And so here we go back to God again, verse 27. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And God has and God has appointed in the church. And now we're going to hear some of the, the giftedness that he has appointed in the church. Okay, uh, God's sovereign appointments. First, apostles. Now the term for the 12 plus Paul as an apostle to the Gentiles and all were chosen by Christ and thus called apostles of Christ. The 12 we know were, uh, and, and Paul on the Damascus road. Galatians 1.1, Paul says that he is an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So Paul 
speaks of himself as one of the apostles. And, and they were given three primary responsibilities, the, the apostles were, to lay the foundation of the church, Ephesians 2.20 having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So to lay the foundation, to receive, declare, and write God's word. Paul understood this, by the way. He understood that God was using him to lay the foundation through the written word, inspired word of God. In Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by, listen to what he says, by revelation, there was, there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief, by referring to this, when you read, so he's writing something they can read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of, of Christ, uh, God's fulfillment of his plan in Christ, the gospel, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles, revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. So they laid the foundation of the church uh, along with that receiving, declaring, writing the word of God and apostles, uh, give confirmation of the word through signs, wonders, and miracles. A couple places point this out, and this we see in the book of Acts. Second Corinthians chapter 12, 12, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you, Paul reminds the Corinthian church, by signs and wonders and miracles. And Hebrews 2, 3 and 4, very important passage, speaking about um, the the uh, the apostles receiving the word spoken from the Lord, and then it was confirmed to us by, uh, or, or the Hebrew, the writer of the Hebrews is saying to the church, that word was confirmed to us by those who heard, those of the apostles, God testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. Just wanted you to see apostles and the special nature of them that's not a gift that is in operation today this is this was a gift that was for uh, the foundation of the church second prophets another gift that i would say was for the foundation of the church because this was those who speak forth a message listen received by direct revelation from god the scripture is complete we're not receiving that anymore the foundation has been laid third teachers those with a special ability to explain and root and ground members of the church in the truth of God's revelation, which would, today we would call the Bible or God's word. Um, miracles, workings of supernatural power, uh, gifts of healing, miraculous acts of healing. I'm not talking about doctors here, but those who God used to bring instantaneous healing to someone. And notice those two gifts, miracles and healing, they were important, I believe, in confirming the authenticity of the early church. You see this in the book of Acts uh, because God was confirming, this is my work. And then you see helps, a special ability or burden to serve, it would seem. Administrations, the word comes from a word that means to pilot a ship. And so a special ability to give leadership, uh, to see things accomplished efficiently and effectively. Uh, when they had a, a trouble with the widows uh, from di two different uh, ethnic backgrounds in the early church in Acts chapter 6, they were looking for uh, people who could administrate that. They had, had to have some ability to give some leadership and 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 see things go forward in a proper way. Those two gifts, helps and administration, were necessary to the welfare of the church, ensuring uh, that proper ministry took place. And then down here, at the last thing he mentions, various kinds of tongues. Now that's the power, as we looked last week, to speak other languages that one did not know. And Paul places this at the bottom of the list. I'm not making a big point there, but he doesn't start with it. He starts with the gifts that laid the foundation for the church. He says, all are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, verse 29, are they? 
All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? And the answer is no, because God has not appointed it that way. Remember, these are gifts God is giving, appointing. Um, God has appointed in the church, verse, verse 28. Well, finally, our unity is rooted in a desire for edification. That's what the gifts are all about. Look at verse 31. Earnestly desire the greater gifts. Now, that's an interesting phrase. We come back to it and we'll say more about it in chapter 14. But I think Paul means earnestly desire the gifts that are of greater blessing in the way of edifying the assembled uh, church body and all of its, its members. So after prioritizing love in chapter 13, that's where we'll go next, Paul returns to this thought in chapter 14. So look at verses 1 through 3 there. Pursue love, what he's just talked about in 13, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy, because the foundation of the church was being laid, understand. For one who speaks in a tongue, the gift of tongues, does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands. But in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. So I think, because this is a different, difficult phrase, earnestly desire the greater gifts, I think the greater gifts are the ones most edifying uh, to all. Tongues was not. We, we see that clearly in, in chapter 14. From the context, I think Paul was saying tongues was not uh, certainly not a greater gift. And at his point in church history, when the foundation was being laid, he is saying desire prophecy, which edifies all, over tongues, which does not edify all. So what does that say uh, about the belief then in Paul's day or now that tongues is a sign of deeper spirituality? Well, it says that it is not biblical thinking. And so don't think that way, church. Apply verse 31 today, I would say, earnestly desire the greater gifts. Apply it today as a prayer, a desire that God would richly supply to the local church the gifts that most edify the body or that are most needed in the body, and that he would use your gift to edify the body. Pastor Matt? The word gifts are the greater gifts. The ministry of the word, the communication and the proclamation of God's word. Any any gift um, that's a word gift is a greater gift. It is not because of the people who God chooses to give that yeah, gift right. by his grace. It's because of the transforming power of God's word. How does the Bible start? God brings the heavens and the earth into existence. How? By the power of his word. Think about when we're lost in sin and blind to our own sin. How does God start to stir us up and awaken us to the reality of sin? By the power of his word, specifically the word of his holiness, the word of his commandments. How does he give us new hearts and save us? By the power of his word, the word of the gospel. How does he strengthen and edify the church? By the power of his word. And I can slide in here a personal application this is why each believer uh, in your own life in our own lives need to continually avail ourselves to the word of god we should be putting ourselves under the word of god at church looking forward to that coming under the word availing ourselves of the word but in our own lives personal devotional time time reading the word time reading about the word in good books uh listening to the word some of you i know listen to the word maybe on an iPad or maybe CD. Maybe some of you are um, really old school and have cassette tapes listening to the Word of God. But put ourselves under the Word of God because of its transforming power. I, what, I do want to read a cross-reference on this, and I know, you, I know you'll like this one. Well, I, I assume that you like all of them, but here's a classic one from Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. For just as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but they water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, 
giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Vivid picture of God speaking forth his word to create the results that he wants. Well, for the record, I did like that uh, cross-reference. I'm going to bring this to a close. Let me reiterate the outline and then give you some simple implications that I pray you'll take to heart. Uh, our unity is rooted in the Holy Spirit we've seen. Our unity is rooted in the worth of every member. It's rooted in the sovereign grace of God. It's rooted in the necessity of each member. It's rooted in the sovereign appointments of God. And it is rooted in a desire for edification, the last point that we were talking about. So here's some implications. Number one, the reason for the Corinthians' disunity was not the diversity of gifts, but their attitudes right. toward that diversity. They were placing importance on a certain gift, tongues, thinking it was a sign of spirituality. And that was wrong. Number two, thoughts of superiority are sinful. To think ever, uh, we need me, but we don't need him, is unbiblical. And, and it is a sinful thought. Uh, thoughts of inferiority, on the other hand, they're sinful too. To think in your mind, the church doesn't need me, well, that's unbiblical. And that is a sinful thought. Number four, we should have the same care for one another. If that's not happening, it may be the church's oversight, or it may be the member's failure to avail himself to the ministry of others. And we need to correct both of those. Number five, pray that God would generously supply us the gifts we need in every local church. Those gifted to teach the word as those gifted in personal care. Both are vital, just like all the organs and parts of the body are vital. Number six, if you're not seeking to serve others, you're not using your spiritual gift. And number seven, the local church as a body is God's design for every believer today. Um, if you're not part of a church body for something that you think is a good reason, I want you to look past the poor example you might have had in your life of what a church is supposed to be or that you've heard about or that you've experienced personally and hurtfully. And you need to trust God's design because God's design is not going to change. You are to be a member of what God has designed. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We ask your blessing on the word today. We ask your blessing on families as best they can. They will be celebrating uh, moms in the different homes. We thank you for this picture of the church, this illustration of the church. And Lord, we want to work like a healthy body works. Every member doing his part, uh, listening to the head, honoring you, giving glory to you because we're doing what we meant to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're visiting with us and um, would like to connect with us, if there's a way we can pray for you, serve you, if you need spiritual counsel, or if you'd like to request a Bible study, message us, find us through the Facebook, or go to uh, northharford.org slash connect, northharford.org slash connect. There's a connect page. Um, join us tomorrow morning at 830 on the live stream for morning devotions. Join us 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday at the GoToMeeting platform for congregational prayer time. Again, with that, no one is obligated to pray, but everyone will have the opportunity to pray. If you just want to come in and listen in and pray in your heart, that's totally fine. Join us after that. Wednesday, 7 p.m., we'll be back in the study, continuing through 1 Peter. Thank you for joining us. God bless you, and happy Mother's Day. God bless.